I love to be uh, talking about the European Union because um, um, it's a thing that nobody understands, least of all those people that run it, uh, and about which everybody has fabulously strong opinions, uh, which uh, nobody can really explain. Uh, people get very, very angry about um, the European Union, and then they probably forget about it the minute they step out of the conversation they're in. Uh, it's um, a, a bogey, I can think I can say. It's, it's, it's a thing that we feel sure that we know about. And I have to say, um, uh, to explain why I was you know, talking about this and all those other things, I did this, um, I was at the Centre for the Study of Democracy with uh, Dave Chandler looking at the European Union at uh, University of Westminster for about um, uh, four years and, and um, this was the outcome of my research. And um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to be able to shed light on the, the things that make you cross, if you, I'm sure you're above all that, but um, uh, the things that make people so heated. I've, I've got only this <coughs> one tiny insight into the life of Nigel Farage, which was um, uh, to be have been on the other side of the fence, because when I was a boy in the 1970s, I was at um, a, a, a bog standard comprehensive school in South London called Kingsdale, which was a lovely place, um, but rather futuristic. But we shared a wall with Dulwich College. There was a, a nine foot high wall at the end of our playground, the beginning of their playing fields. And, um, uh, uh, and Dulwich College, we knew, was where uh, uh, the future elite were being raised. And uh, so we could, if we were, you know, we could get a leg up and, you know, at the cost of scratching our chins, you could peer over. And uh, what you would see would be these boys, um, it was the 1970s, you have to understand, marching up and down in military um, formation and uniforms. They were just like us, you know, 11, 12, but they were there doing this <laughs> and marching up and down. And, and we kind of knew that they were preparing, as it were, to put us down. That was what was in the back of their minds. Um, well, Mrs. Thatcher sorted all that out, so they didn't need them. Um, but I, it was only years later I worked out that one of the boys that was strutting up and down must have been the young Nigel Farage on the other side of the wall. <laughs> Uh, I'm a bit of a Eurosceptic now, so I think I might have climbed over the wall and, and got onto his side, but you can pull me up for that. I don't want to commit, but um, uh, this is the issue, it seems to me. All of the uh, question of the European Union is not a, really a conversation about the European Union at all. I could go far as to say there isn't a European Union, it really isn't an institution of any uh, uh, great influence whatsoever. Uh, it's, it doesn't actually decide a great many things that are terribly important, except by default or by mistake. It really isn't as, as an immensely powerful an institution as it appears to those who are unduly terrified by it. Um, it is, formally speaking anyway, merely a contractual arrangement between a number of sovereign states. That's um, uh, the official... Um, international relations theory of what the European Union is. It is a treaty. It's a treaty organisation. But we all know that's not true. We know that it's, uh, that can't be the whole thing because we turn the TV on every night and we see that Europe has done this and Europe has done that and um, we must do this because of the European Union, we must do that because of the European Union and we're, we're, we're convinced that there, there really is this thing called the European Union which is making decisions which affect our lives. And <coughs> it's, it's not very easy to unpick that uh, problem and try and understand why it looks like that. And um, I'm good, just to compact, you know, conscious of my 20 minutes, I want to compact the argument and say this. It's very simple, really. The only reason there is a European Union, or in its contemporary version anyway, the only reason it, it, it has the authority it does is that nation states in the modern world, these nation states that we know in Europe, um, uh, surrender their authority. And when they do that, they're breaking all the laws of international relations. They're behaving very eccentrically. It's quite strange. In the whole of um, the history of nation states, it's quite exceptional that nation states would ever willingly give up their powers to somebody else. 
Uh, it's quite exceptional in all circumstances, I think. You know, who willingly says, um, you know, I'm so fed up with being responsible and in control of myself. Uh, I might be so much happier if you would make my decisions for me. That would make me, you know, that would be a great relief. It's a kind of, can I say, it's like masochism, isn't it? It's, it's like, um, uh, I don't want to think too hard about that, but um, there's something a little bit perverted about this desire to shuck off the responsibility. How could it be? There are a few precedents in history. Um, in the West Indies, this would be my example, in the West Indies, after the abolition of slavery, all the uh, little islands in the British West Indies, Jamaica and Ghana and, and uh, Trinidad, they had legislative councils, autonomous legislative councils that made their own laws. And then, after the slaves were freed, these legislative councils suddenly discovered that the uh, white ruling elite uh, that was represented there were in the minority and might even be voted out of authority. And they said, you know, it's overrated, this independence lock. So wouldn't we be much happier with a, a governor ruling over us uh, and, um, and the, the English happily provided the governors and there were governors ruling over them and they were much happier because in that case because they didn't like the idea that the, uh, the, Jamaica, the black Jamaicans would have uh, seized control of the polity and taken it away from them. There are other examples, uh, it's too big the other example uh, which I can't use because it's too mad and it would blast the discussion which would be uh, what happened when a number of European elites engaged the uh, uh, fascist project and assimilated themselves into the, um, uh, 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 the uh, German program during the Second World War. But I think it's better we forget that. Because if you say fascism, all mind goes away. Um, uh, but there are very few examples. And I think it's a, this is the challenge is, why would you ever do that? Why would any nation state willingly give up its authority to a, uh, a, a, a body over and above it. Well, there are a number of people have tried to explain this in terms of self-interest, that uh, it might be in your self-interest somehow to give up your self-interest. Uh, I think these are largely speaking paradoxes. Um, but I, I think there's, uh, you, you can only look, understand this if you step back and you try and understand the processes that surround the decisions that were made over a number of years from the early 1980s, uh, really in the, under the beginning with the, um, uh, uh, the Delors Commission, I think, uh, where it seemed to make sense to a lot of European nations that they would be much happier if their decisions were not made by them, but by, um, uh, by the European Union and its institutions. And the reason that they did that in the first instance, the, the immediate practical decision is was that they wanted to submit themselves to what's called uh, economic discipline, to fiscal discipline. They felt it would be much easier uh, uh, to manage our economies if uh, we did not have large um, interest groups uh, demanding too much from the centre, from the state, uh, uh, and we were in a position to say to them, no, we cannot observe, you know, we cannot uh, yield to your demands because uh, otherwise we will be breaking the economic discipline uh, that's required of us as participants in the European Central Bank or the European Monetary Union or uh, eventually the Eurozone. And that's why they made those decisions. Elites made those decisions because they wanted to bind their nations, they wanted to make their nations uh, subordinate to a discipline outside of them. And in the first instance, they did it because they would, in some fear, or, or, or uh, maybe fear is too strong a word, but in argument with uh, aggressive lobbies of uh, working class people in trade unions who were asking too much of the state, or producers' lobbies, or uh, uh, various institutions. Uh, 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 various sectional groups that were asking too much of the centre. And at the time they talked about that problem, they talked the prob about the problem of overload. <coughs> they talked about it as a problem of we are overloaded with <coughs> demands. And at that point, this is when the masochism kicked in. Because then 
people like Nigel Lawson even, uh, uh, but much more so uh, uh, people like uh, Francois Mitterrand and uh, 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 participants within the European project, they said it would be good to observe the fiscal discipline the European Union offers because then we will not be beholden to our own publics. And that was really the reason, the strong reason why um, elites within Europe felt that it would be acceptable uh, uh, to bind their successors in agreements uh, uh, to which they could not um, uh, evade. And they would enter into a number of agreements which meant the surrender of their sovereignty, which meant their surrender of their sovereignty over their central banks, because to join the European central banking system, you had to agree that your, your central bank would not engage in inflationary um, uh, activities, it wouldn't increase, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be, you wouldn't use your central bank to boost the economy. Uh, it would observe the fiscal discipline, it would follow, um, as it happens, the, the kind of German I idea of, of fiscal discipline. So it seemed reasonable in that context, let's, let's give it up, you know, this central bank, uh, this, uh, and you used to, uh, uh, when, if you go to the uh, uh, Bank of England Museum, they had on display for many years the letter that Gordon Brown signed, saying that the, the Bank of England is independent. It makes its own policy. We don't make the policy. It seemed like a great idea. Politicians shouldn't be making banking policy. Of course not. Experts should be making banking policy. Experts should be doing it. It's a technocratic problem. Uh, it should not be undertaken for political reasons. It creates problems if there is a political demand uh, on economics. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's great that we should <coughs> shove that used to be a lever of Keynesian economic system, but we'll shove that aside, let's give it to the, uh, uh, it's part of the European Central Bank now, it's independent, uh, we won't mess with it politically. That, in a small version, is uh, what happened more and more. If you look at uh, what happened with the European, uh, sorry, with the uh, Italian uh, uh, labour relations, they'd created this monster, as it seemed to the, uh, um, legislators, which was called Scala Mobile, which was an agreement, uh, a kind of an automatic agreement, that meant that whenever prices went up, wages would go up, which was a very good uh, way of, of calming uh, the strikes that were taking place, because they said, look, you don't have to go on strike all the time, don't go on strike, because whenever prices go up, the wages will go up. That was a promise they made in the 1970s, when things were very rough. And then by the 1980s, every politician, every elite politician, understood they had to get rid of this thing because it was giving too much money uh, uh, to uh, people who were then spending it and creating this inflationary spiral. Well, it was a very complicated situation because all people in power were in agreement. You must get rid of the Scala Mobile. But all people in work were adamant that you mustn't, because obviously if your wages are fixed to prices, that's a great position to be in. And people would have two minds, you know, they would say, as they're watching the TV, they'd say, yeah, we must get rid of that Scala Mobile. Uh, but not for me, <laughs> that mustn't happen. So you had this, this kind of problem, and it was a classic Italian problem, that the political class all knew what they felt needed to be done to become a successful capitalist, um, uh, working um, uh, country, abolish the Scala Mobile, cut the wages, uh, get out of the inflationary spiral. But none of them could convince the electorate to do it. It was impossible to convince the electorate to do it because labor unions were well represented, they were vocal, they, could, uh, they had uh, big influence. Uh, and so he had this nonsensical argument went on for years until eventually they found the solution. They said, it's not us. You know, we, we love this car mobile. You know, we love you to be rich, but we have to observe the discipline of the market. Uh, otherwise, we will not be allowed to join the European Monetary Union. We will not be allowed to join the Euro. And we must abolish the Scala Mobile because it's not what we want, they said. It's what we have to do to be a part of Europe. And that alibi is made again and again and again. 
People say, it's not what we want to do, it's what we must do to become a part of Europe. And Europe itself, I want to say, is the alibi. It's the classic alibi. It's not us, it's them. The European Union actually used to write papers saying, why are we blamed for everything? Well, they should want to be blamed for everything. That's where all their authority came from. You know, what, how did this institution ever get any authority? Because elites wanted to bind uh, themselves and their successors into uh, discipline that they uh, would not be tempted to undo. You may know, you don't, if you don't, I don't mind, uh, uh, the legend of Odysseus. Odysseus was uh, on his ship and, and he was going past the sirens. And the sirens had this, this song, you know, they would sing this song, you couldn't resist it, it was so beautiful. And you, all, all seamen would be, uh, it was a disaster because they would be, go to the rocks and be crushed. Uh, and Odysseus' solution was, he said to his men, he said, right, you lot, he said, wax in your ears, fill your ears up with wax. That's the, the European electorate. Fill your ears up with wax, don't know anything, that's good. And, um, and me, lash me to the mast, he said, the masochist. He said, lash me to the mast, tie me up to the mast. So that, and he says, I'm going to ask you to go over to those rocks where those sirens are. He said, and you're not to listen because you're going to have your ears all waxed up. So anyway, and that's how he did it. And that's a modern capitalist economy, is that uh, they are lashed to the mast willingly because they know they don't want to be on the rocks, on the rocks of um, aggressive, uh, um, argumentative electorates who are constantly demanding things. It's so much easier to say, no, 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 we'd love to do this, you know, it would be great to live in cornucopia, it would be, you know, you could be rich. But unfortunately, we must observe the discipline of I, A, the market, or B, the European Union, which is a kind of institutional way of saying the same thing. So, where am I for time? Uh, we've probably got about five minutes. So, that's, this is my basic argument, is that um, why we have a European Union is because that thing, that core thing, which was the life of European nation-states, the system of nation-states, has gone, and then uh, not gone completely, but it's largely uh, it, it's a lot <coughs> than it was. What I mean to say is that um, European nation states, in their classic form, are, are lively places, often insane uh, in the way they carried on with each other, to, to destructive instead. You know, it's the place where we we've, we've killed each other at, at, with with gusto on several occasions. Uh, and partly because they're very, you know, because these nation states are competitive institutions, aggressive towards each other. And, um, uh, you know, when you see that historically, you can see the kind of appeal of, wouldn't it be nice if uh, we didn't have to decide these questions, if experts would make the decisions for us, and then we would be released from that bad uh, feeling. But what gave the life to the European states? What made them so argumentative and aggressive? I want to say this, they were um, politically alive, they were argumentative, there were places where a substantial number of the uh, citizens were members of political parties and that they engaged in debate, um, or often eccentrically formalised, uh, oddly bureaucratic, but nonetheless a lot more lively than it is today. We're in an opposite kind of a world. We're in a kind of Generation Y world. It's, uh, it's not hierarchical. It's flat. Um, its politics are uh, not remotely focused on the nation state. There is, uh, the, the, they won. You know, the Triennial Commission that said we, there are too many demands on the state. They won. You know, people don't make demands on the state in the way they did. They don't organize international constituencies making these big pleas for, for different things. Most people, uh, especially if the younger people, they're negotiating a world where there is not nation states as a focus of their political um, and uh, social aspirations. And they're unconnected to that. And all politicians know this to be true. Because uh, electorates are not terribly interested in what politics does. The constituent assemblies, the parliaments are empty shells. They're not places of contestation. Uh, they are lifeless. 
Uh, and um, uh, you know, there is a, we know there's an argument every five years, and, and whatever the result is, you're always a bit frustrated by it, or very frustrated by it. Uh, but it, it's quite hard to own it. I think there's very few people that feel a strong sense of ownership of that relationship. At the most, we're watchers, like uh, watching a kind of a game show. We're not terribly involved. We don't feel any uh, strong identification with it. And it's because it, uh, my uh, excellent friend, uh, Chris Pickerton, uh, wrote a book about the same time as me, and he, he had a better line than me, which I had to concede to him now. He said, modern states in Europe are not states. You know, they're just not. They're not nation states, as they were. He says they are what they call themselves. They are member states. They are member states, which means that their authority does not derive from their populace. They're not really democratic, properly. Their, their authority derives from their relationship as members of the European Union. Where do they feel at home, those leaders? I think they feel more a greater sense of security amongst each other than they do with us. When they're wandering about, there's a kind of fear out there. It's always a bit like Gordon Brown and that bigoted woman. You know, they always think they're going to be ambushed by uh, somebody who doesn't kind of, you know, isn't part of their circle. They're not really happy with the populace, but they love it hanging out with the big leaders at the summits. They feel a much greater sense of affinity. What do they talk about? They talk about the fact that we all hate them. That's, you know, that's, that's what binds them together as a group, is that they're leaders who are not liked. Uh, and they, they feel a strong sense of identification at that point. And that's the European Union, writ large. It's non-majoritarian. It really is not very democratic, not if you mean by democracy uh, the rule of the people. If you mean that uh, judges should sort out problems uh, that people appeal under the rule of law, it's very democratic. And that's meaning of democratic, it's democratic. But if you mean the people rule, that's not the European Union. It just isn't. It's a place where experts make decisions. It gives in from time to time, but its whole life is about taking the politics out of decisions and making them expert. Uh, and that's why it makes such terrible mistakes. That's my last point, I know I'm slightly over. It makes terrible decisions all the time. The worst decisions. It made a, a, quite a foolish decision, I think, in the Ukraine. Not that they were wrong, it's just that how could you, you, you can imagine this conversation, Rompuy and Putin. And uh, Rompuy's thinking, this Putin is like a man from the past with all his talk of geopolitics and NATO and all the rest of it. And Putin's looking at him thinking, are you crazy? What, you think I want NATO on my doorstep? And it's a, it's, the conversation is going past each other because one man is from one era, one man is from another era. There, there's no communication. They don't understand that they're both undertaking actions which are gonna have dramatic and destructive consequences. Putin, because he's, he's who he is, uh, but on the European Union side, because they don't understand politics. They're technocrats. They don't understand it. Christine, um, Lagarde, Christine Lagarde said the other day, was uh, 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 the other day, some time ago, she said, you know, we did a terrible thing in Greece. Uh, we really messed up. We, you know, we, we wrecked Greece. It was a real destructive thing. And you're thinking, yeah, we know. Why did you do it? <laughs> and I know why she did it. I know why they all did it, because they were listening to bankers, experts. Uh, they were, you know, they were thinking not in political terms at all. They weren't talking to constituencies. Maybe they shouldn't have listened too closely to some of those constituencies, but they should have at least been talking to them, but they weren't. They were talking to experts who were dealing with numbers, not human beings who were dealing with real uh, uh, social events. And that's the cost of not having a lively political democratic institution. Okay, thank you very much, James. <laughs> okay, that was quite a bit there to, to get your teeth into, <laughs> I think. So um, I'll start with you first, Simon. Is there anything you'd like, any specific questions or points you would like to come back on, uh, any points you'd like to make yourself? Um, I suppose. 
one of the things about these debates is it, it's very easy to get into word choices. So it's quite interesting. You can use an emotive term like surrender your sovereignty. And it's quite fun, fascinating to think if you put the word pool in there, that's a very different feeling. So maybe it's an academic sense, but I always get that. It's very interesting. One of the problems, and I wouldn't necessarily declare any position on the European Union, but one of the issues that you get is you know, the choices of words. And one of the problems for the European Union is that it is something that's slightly remote. I mean, we have this at the university. Students are sort of like, well, I don't want to do the European Union. It's boring and hard. But the students absolutely want to do the nuances of the Chinese Communist Party. And they get that like that. <laughs> but they don't get the European Union. And part of that is an issue that is part of the problem for the European Union. But also, I think one of the things that comes out is that, again, you can replace certain words. And I suppose that was the question that I was nagging me throughout, is you switched a bit. There was a bit of the IMF in there. There was a bit of globalisation. There was a bit of democratic nature in the UK. So it's all those sort of things. So in some, some respects, capitalism, liberalism, whatever. But, you know, what is... the specific charge that's the European Union and not the European Union as a vehicle for delivering neoliberalism or for delivering globalisation. Perhaps, and again, you were critical of it, so the obvious academic question is what would you do instead? So have a think about that. But I thought there were some interesting points there. I think having spent a lot of time looking at the European Union, there are some decisions that are made by the experts, but anything that does seem to get political, and again, I think James was right, the European Union is an interesting body because it does get lots of people very passionate, but I was thinking about it on my way here, the European Union has got nothing pretty much to do with the transport system in the UK, it's got very little, if nothing at all to do with my taxes, very little to do with my son's education, lots of really important things in my life, the European Union has nothing to do with and that is still done in London or the capital cities. The European Union does lots of things that involve free movement and border and working across borders. So that is again the interesting point is a lot of the really political things have never meant to be done at the European level. They're always still within the national governments. Where the European Union is often criticised is this sort of democratic deficit but some of that is more, and again, that's where James, I agree with him to some extent, is that it's more to do with the weaknesses of national parliaments. If you debate the bill in Westminster at two o'clock in the morning, and the bill's been signed four hours ago, of course the national parliament isn't going to be very powerful. If the national parliament gets the bill eight weeks before the debate and is able to make comments, which is one of the changes that have been made, then perhaps that may not change all of the issues about democracy, but at least parliamentarians are getting a viewpoint. That's not the European Union's fault, that was the fault of the British Parliament. So I think those types of issues, and again, when you go through the system, I'm not quite sure I'd agree that you take the politics out of decisions. I can see the point about the economic one, but. The idea, and again, this is the sort of thing that we talk about quite a lot with our students, the idea that you, know, you weren't in the room when the decision was made is sort of farcical. You know, there's thousands of civil servants, not necessarily thousands of civil servants in the European Union. That's another myth about the European Union. I think the statistic we know or we think is there's a number of civil servants, about the same number of people who work for Birmingham City Council. So it's not a very big organisation. And lots of national governments are based in Brussels. And they see all of the documentation and they comment on it and they know what's going on. So this idea of sort of, you can blame Brussels, that's a very important sort of get out for national governments. But the idea that they don't know about what's going on is a really important sort of thing that we need to challenge because they do. They know about it all the time. The Commission has the right to propose legislation, but it can't propose legislation or it's unlikely to propose legislation that's not going to be approved. So I think that's again something that they work with national governments, they know where national governments feel on certain issues. And again, the Commission only has powers in certain <coughs> areas. 
So again, going back to my original point, it is quite interesting to look at where the European Union has power and where it doesn't have power. So I think there's a number of things here. There's a critique of capitalism and free markets, which the European Union embodies to some extent, although for other people it's a possible solution. The idea that the Czech Republic can keep... I saw a statistic that says the annual GDP of the Czech Republic is about the same as General Motors. And if you think about the European Union, it's made up of lots of small countries, pretty much. And the idea that they can compete and work together, sorry, they can compete individually against the NAFTAs and the East Asian markets, I think sometimes it depends on where you're looking at these things from. You know, if you're a, the Czechs or if you're the Irish or whatever, it can make sense to be looking at this sort of there's power in a union is one of the sort of headlines I have seen and there's a power in this union for some countries in terms of the security that it gives them. Again, Europe's not necessarily, um, or the European Union is not necessarily perfect, but I think, you know, we do have to work out what we're criticising. If we're criticising the free market nature, that's one thing, but that's not the critique of the European Union per se, it's a critique of free markets. If we're talking about democracy, there is a challenge there, but there's also a challenge at national level. So I think there's a number of different things that I think you know, make the European Union complicated. <coughs> if you disaggregate them all, then you have to know what you're critiquing. I think some of that was a critique of the free market. And again, you know, that is your ideological. People's position on that it depends on their ideology. But I think to just criticise the European Union for the faults of the free market isn't necessarily the European Union's, how to put it, it's not their fault, that's how it was designed, and therefore, you know, that's the critique which we live in, in terms of, there was, a, there was one point, yeah, so again, you know, you then went and talked about the Bank of England getting made independent, so it's more, it was more than the orthodoxy of the European Union, it was how governments wanted to run themselves, so again, I think that was slightly different. So I think there's lots of interesting stuff, and I think one of the important things about James's book and also this debate is actually just trying to talk about the European Union in a slightly more sensible way than the Nick Clegg versus Farage, where you've got very little to go on apart from two very opposing ideals. And I think some of that's about sort of working out where the European Union has done good. There are ideas about equal work for equal pay, where a legal ruling has actually meant that men and women get equal pay for equal work, which would be seen to be a good thing. Chris Davis, who's a Liberal Democrat MP in the North West, he says, I've got much more influence as a member of parliament in the European Parliament because a decision that we can push through on the environment affects 570 million people in the 28 member states. If I was in Westminster, I'd be a part of a small group of Liberal, Liberal Democrats now in coalition, but when he was saying this, it was before that. So again, changes that happen at a positive level within the European Union affect millions of people more than they would do in a national context. So there is a positive side on some angles for the European Union. Okay, that, that's a good place to end the, the, the idea, that there's, there's a positive side to it. Uh, you've also given me an idea for a future salon, which is the nuances of the Chinese Communist Party. Interesting to you so much. Jim. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I've got similar points, actually. So um, I'll be much briefer, uh, uh, and then we can get on to getting the audience in. Um, first things first, James, just to say that um, I, I have read the book and really enjoyed it. I think there's lots of really interesting stuff in there. And um, I think you're right, um, you're right about the discipline argument when it's applied to economic policy. I think that's exactly what has happened both in the UK and, and in the EU more generally. Uh, politicians use the European Union and particular policies such as the RM and the Eurozone as a way of tying their own hands and as a way of insulating themselves from interest group pressure and that's a way of uh, depoliticising policy, um, taking the politics out of policy, if you like, making it very technocratic. And I think that's part of the reason why people sometimes are very frustrated about the whole process. They feel themselves as being depoliticised, not having an active, active stake. And I think I think that argument is is absolutely right. I think, I think there's a lot of scholarship on that, which would which would back that up. I guess where I where I 
differ from you, and this goes to, to, to the points that some were making, I think, I think it's only part of the story actually is, you know, there's a lot more to the story about the EU and its impact on politics both in the UK and elsewhere than that particular argument. And as Simon said, the story uh, actually in some ways can be, you, know, you can tell a different story which is much more positive, uh, if you like, about the impact of the EU. For, for many groups in the UK and other, and other parts of the EU, uh, other, parts, uh, other member states in the EU, the, the, the EU is a very positive thing, it empowers them. Uh, and it helps them to achieve things that they that their governments are stopping them from doing because their governments actually they don't they're, they're actually not representative in that sense. So as as Simon says, you know, gender equality, uh, rights for women, the EU is is helped uh, uh, women to achieve things uh, uh, and rights uh, 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 in in a, in a range of different areas in terms of work and so on and so forth uh, over over the decades. Uh, another example, uh, rights for for low paid people, um, part-time workers, the EU has is, 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 is helped to improve standards in, in, in the labour market in that sense. <clears throat> clean beaches, clean water would be another, environment would be another example. Um, regional funding, funding for cities like Leeds, Sheffield in the north, the EU is, is provided a vital source of, of funding in that sense. So, so I think the story is much more, uh, you know, it's much more complicated than just the discipline, tying our hands, depoliticising argument. Um, so that would be the first, the, the first point I, I, I want to make, which kind of backs up uh, Simon's point. The second point I want to make is about your conception of nation states and politics in the past. This idea that nation states in the past were politically active, they were sites of debate, partisanship, places of contestation. Uh, I'm thinking about Britain and, you know, I think you, you can look at it in a different way. Contestation, uh, political contestation in Britain both in the past and the present, the way of looking at it is just political point scoring. Be uh, different sides just talking at each other, sloganising, not actually uh, talking <coughs> about the issues in any meaningful or detailed way, but, but, but just hurling insults at each other. I remember I grew up in the 80s, so I remember politics in the 80s under Mrs Thatcher, and in some ways partisanship was, was actually very constraining uh, on, on the debate in politics. I remember, mean, you know, you, you were either for that, you were, you know, as a student, you were either a supporter of Thatcher or you weren't. And there wasn't much thinking that went on. You, you went with one side or another and, you, and, you know, you had to stay on that side. And if you moved sides, you were seen as kind of like a, almost like a traitor, really. So um, partisanship, you know, you, I mean, you, you kind of sort of celebrate partisanship at the domestic level. But, you know, you can tell a different story about partisanship, which it can stifle debate. It can constrain debate. In, 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 in certain ways as well. And you also talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, politics in the past, people not having much ownership now and owning, owning decisions in the past. And, and in that sense, uh, you know, nation states are kind of dying or becoming less democratic. You know, I'm, I'm not sure people really, certainly in this country, anyway, really feel that much ownership back in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. Well, you know, I don't think you know. I don't think it was the case even then, really. Um, you know, when I think about 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 uh, you know uh, the practice of politics in the forties, fifties, and sixties and seventies, I think of sort of again a sort of a consensus politics. You know, it's sort of certainly up until the nineteen sixties, where where people just kind of supported a party and went along and did what their dads did and what their grandfathers did and so on and so forth. And sometimes I wonder whether you've got a kind of a a bit of a romanticised notion. Of, uh, of democracy in the past. I'm not sure it was quite as lively uh, and, <coughs> and, uh, and um, uh, 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 as contested as, as, as you suggest. So in that sense, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure the nation states have died quite as much as you imply that they have as, 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 you know, and since, you know, since uh, the EU has is, is kind of uh, had such a, a powerful impact. So I'll leave it there. Okay, well, thank you very much. Right. James, before we bring the audience in, I'll give you a chance to respond to some of that, and then we'll see what oh, yeah, the audience I mean, thinks. I, I don't want to like, get, take all the time, but um, so on the anti-capitalism point, you know, that obviously you, you, you got me. I am a bit on the left, it's true. <laughs> but I, I, I'd happily give it up. I mean to say, I've got loads of friends who write um, uh, angry books about uh, Euro-capitalism, and uh, they, they think um, uh, oh look, the thing about this um, this European Union 
is it's just a vehicle for these um, uh, market discipline. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular guy. And um, uh, I say to him, I say, well, I'd rather see it the other way around. You know, this, this market discipline is just a vehicle um, uh, for this long-term trend that we're talking about. Um, you know, it, it, there are other problems come up, but the, the, the general trajectory is the same. And um, it's, it's more debilitating, I think, than, than either of you allow, is that um, um, when your decisions are not made in your own country, you can't even influence them. You know, and what was happening to the Greeks? You know, Greek politics, please. You know, I'm sure there's a lot to be said about what was going wrong. Uh, but uh, uh, look at the, the kind of frustration and insanity, and, and in Spain just moments ago, uh, of, of masses, masses of people protesting and not knowing where to protest. You know, where, where, you know whose offices do you storm? You know, which, <laughs> you, you, they're not even in the country, you know, there's, a, there's, there's three of them in an office, apparently, the Troika, and um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a really debilitating kind of experience, and, 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 and humiliating and, and demoralizing for the Greeks, you know, because it really meant that um, uh, no kind of sensible centrist position could be done, because Fundamentally, they had no responsibility for their own decision. You know, it had been taken away from them, and that was a really shocking thing. The Greek, you know, uh, 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 never mind Greece. Brian Lenihan going and and pleading, you know, uh, that we should not be bailed out. This was the position of the Irish government: do not bail us out. They were saying. Uh, well, the meaning to say was: we know that the conditions you will attach to the bailout. Um, would be more, uh, would be what they dread as, as Irishmen, a loss of sovereignty. Is that a trivial word? I don't think it's a trivial word at all. Um, it sounds old fashioned, it sounds like the Second World War, it sounds like that, but is it, what we really mean is uh, control, isn't it? Of, you know, to, to decide for yourselves, to decide, and not perfect. You know, I know that. 1950s consensus politics was far from perfect. It was, it was weird. Apart from anything else, you know, it was homophobic and racist and um, uh, uh, very sexist and, and uptight and all these other things. There was this one small factor about it, which was that many, many more people were involved in the decision-making process. I mean to say that there were two million members. Two million? Can you imagine that? of the Conservative Party, of the Conservative Party. The affiliated membership of the Labour Party, 17 million through the trade unions, and uh, uh, you know, uh, something like a half a million members. In, in, if you can believe this, in 1947, there were a quarter of a million signed up communists in Britain, quarter of a million. Now, all those politics are frustrating and ridiculous and all the rest of it. But think of that, that great pyramid of, of decision making. I was really opposed to it at the time because I thought it was a, a trap, you know, I raged against it. But actually, that is um, quite a lively conservative small C in many ways. Uh, but nonetheless, it meant a strong degree of identification with decisions about the wage, <coughs> about development, about all these things. That's quite, I, you know, I'm not lionising it as the past, but you have to understand why, why the bit we're in now looks so strange. This kind of third way, um, uh, uh, horizontal, not vertical, uh, where nobody really knows where are the levers of power. We're, we're all like the Greeks, aren't we? We're, you know, we don't know where to storm what Bastille to storm. We don't even know where to register our vote. We're probably online, um, you know, through a letterbox. Um, uh, it's not that you know, it's not that uh, the oppressors have come and taken the power from us. It just isn't anywhere. It's gone, isn't it? It's it's in Europe, a place which, may I say, does not exist. Does it? Where Europe? Where is that exactly? Have you been to Europe? 
Are we in it? It's, it's just too big a place to exist. You can't say, it. where is it? It's in Europe. It just it doesn't make any sense, does it? And uh, it, 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 that the European Union is, is the, the modern day um, uh, emperor's new clothes, isn't it? It's, it's not, it, it's really, it's the lying, cheating, evasion of all the national governments who've refused responsibility for their own political processes and have magicked up this non-existent like the land uh, in Swift's story of Laputa that used to hover above with experts pulling levers to decide things. But it's never there. You see, you never visit the place. Um, I've been to Brussels. Even when you go to Brussels, turns out it's not there. They're all in Strasbourg. 